this week's episode of Faster Masters Rowing Radio. Grab a seat at the table as Masters Rowing Coaches Marlene Royal and Rebecca Caro share their biggest secrets on how to unleash your hidden potential and plot a new course for real results on the water and off. Now, on to the show. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Faster Masters Rowing Radio, where today we are talking about rowing boat damage and repair. I'm Rebecca Caro, and I'm joined by Marlene Royal. Uh, hello, Rebecca, and hello to our Faster Masters out in the audience. I'm going to kick off with something that I didn't tell you I was going to do, Marlene, but I got okay. the nicest email, and I'm going to read it out, and it comes from someone who's talking about the Masters Rowing International Facebook group. Someone said, I wanted to thank you for MRI, as they call it. It's such a gift for rowers. I put up a post about something that I had a question on, and bam, so much wonderful information. Gods, I am not alone. Other people are having this nap phenomenon. There's even another person who's managing an autoimmune thing. Smart suggestions, links, jokes, dot, dot, dot. This kind of resource is the wow. And that's just the tiny I have a little question angle. There are so many posts with news, information, and technical insight. You are just the very best for starting and keeping this going. Thank you. Like uh, That made my day. Totally. Now, rowing boat damage. It's a fact of rowing life that we would mostly love to go away, uh, but sadly it doesn't. We will damage boats. Boats will get damaged at some point during your rowing career. So as a club organizer, as a coach, as an athlete owning a private boat, what can you do about it in order to minimize this? I think, I think that's always your goal with, with boat damage. So let's talk first about what are the things that tend to cause boat damage? Well, I would say the way, uh, the way you handle the boat in and out of the rack in the boathouse can certainly be one way that you can damage your boats, whether you're hitting riggers or your boat is in a really tight rack. Um, so that can damage boats. Um, obviously, bumping into things, steering, not paying attention to where you're going and nicking something or actually colliding into something can, can damage boats. Um, coming into a dock incorrectly can damage your boat. Um, those are a couple things that come yeah. up off the top of my head. <laughs> and for me... Yeah, the other big category is wear and tear. There are a lot of bits of boats which I would consider to be consumables that at some point will wear out. They're plastic, they wear thin, you know, threads or nuts and bolts get stripped for whatever reason. Your shoes, you know, the heels collapse or the stitching goes or in the true story case of my husband's school boys who he used to coach, they replaced the shoes in an eight one year. And a lot of the kids rode without wearing socks. And within a year, the insides had all rotted out. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Well, and you're right. Like, and like your the wheels of your seat, okay, your tracks. I personally, I've had my boat for a long time. And I have literally worn through three set, at least three sets of tracks over yeah. the years. Exactly. <laughs> so, you know, tracks, seats, uh, what, what other kinds of, like you said, just nuts and bolts. No. Orlocks, you know, orlocks are, are oh. things that honestly should be changed every year because those little shelves wear. Um, not every and, year, Marlene, really not every year because different ones of, of different types of plastic. There are lots of copies of the Concept 2 orlocks which are made with slightly more robust plastic. Mm -hmm. And But, but the, the thing that you mentioned, which is a lot of people don't realize, you mentioned slides. If your slides are worn, your wheels are worn. So you should replace right. both. If yeah. your oarlocks are worn, the sleeves and collars on your oars and skulls are worn. And you should look at those as well. So, for example, some designs of, interestingly, really older and more recent collars are reversible. They have two uh, sides to them. And if you wear one side, you can take it off. You usually have to swap bow side and stroke side, but you can turn it around so that the side that's rubbing against the oarlock is 
further away and you've got a new fresh side. So you, right. you get double use out of them. Yeah, that's pretty handy. And also things like the way, depending on what type of shoes you use in your boat, how the shoes are actually um, attached to the foot stretchers can wear out in some older, you know, sort of yeah. traditional type of type of uh, configurations where, where the shoe is just screwed into, into the foot plate and it isn't a more sort of robust structure. Absolutely, absolutely. And so basically, firstly, you need to notice what things are wearing out and you need to have a means of keeping an eye on them so that you can you know, tactically replace them. So let's first start talking about boat maintenance. What are the things you should be doing daily, weekly, monthly to keep an eye on the state of the equipment that you use? Well, when you're, when you're getting ready to go on the water, either, either depending on what your situation is at the boathouse, either put your boat up on slings and just quick give your boat a quick check over the tracks, the oar locks. Um, I always like to check the, the, the nut underneath the pin. Is that okay? Um, is the top bolt okay? Um, you can also do that at the dock quickly if, if there isn't a line to get on the dock. But I think you should scan your boat and just like quick make sure things, things are finger tight. I always check my rigger, my, my rigger screws on and off with thumb screws. I always just check that that's okay because you never mm. know something could happen some, you know, somebody could be fiddling around in the boathouse and wander in from the beach or the street and loosen something and, you know, off your rigger goes. Um, so and we also, have weekly, we have a weekly boat washing. We row on fresh water. So fortunately, we don't have to wash our boats and it's not a very dirty lake. But once a week on a Saturday, we all wash the boats. And that's the opportunity to notice things and to do quick bits of repair. As you say, the boats are already on trestles. And so it's pretty easy. Yeah, that's an, that's important. And, and obviously, when you wipe your boat down, when you come in, just paying attention, you know, if to, you know, did you hear a rattle? Did you did you notice your tracks were sliding or not even, you know, things yeah. like just being attentive. To, yeah. People who forget to tighten up, things work loose, you know, particularly right. your slides. Um, like we had yes, yeah, literally like, yesterday so, so. morning, Someone's slide just shot really far forwards and she had to adjust it in the boat, but it, it was hard to tighten up the wing nuts from inside the boat. It would have been easier to do on the land. Yep. So the, those types of things, like is one sticking out farther than the other and, you know, just again, just being, a, being attentive. Yes. And keeping your boat clean, keeping your boats clean goes a long, long way to reducing the wear and tear. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. We also, uh, so my worst boat rattle story was there was a rattle when we lifted the boat out of the water. And I was like, there's something in the bow canvas. And so we put it on trestles and um, it was a design where there was a compartment to go into the bow canvas, but there was a tiny little hole and the hole was down in the hull, but it was like a little semicircle. It was sort of I don't know why it was there, maybe just air, probably because there wasn't a hatch cover in the top of the bow canvas. Anyway, we discovered somebody had sat in the bow seat and had put a spanner in the bottom of the boat and it had gone under this little hole and had gone right up into the bow and we're standing there and we're like bouncing it and jerking it and holding one end higher than the other. And eventually we managed to line up the spanner so it came out the little hole. It was too small to put your hand in. Wow. Wow. I, I have that kind of situation actually in my boat, because when my boat was built that was in the old days, speed coaches had wiring. Right. And they used to put the internal wiring on before they laid the deck of the boat. Well, over the years, I don't use that wiring anymore. So there's a little piece of that wire inside my boat and I cannot it must be in a compartment. I cannot get it out. I can in all these years. So anyway, did I have a cut, similar story. Did you cut the wire off when you stopped using it? Yeah, I pushed I pushed the little plug in because you couldn't really pull the whole thing out. And I don't know. Uh, I, it's anyway, it's one of yeah, those yeah. things. <laughs> yeah. so. so one of our listeners says I use WD-40 on the wheels of my slide when they're glued. I personally have also used that. It's not a brilliant solution, but, you know, a lubricant of some sort, silicone lubricant is slightly different than WD-40. But absolutely, you know, dirt clogs up moving parts there yeah. is 
an old joke in a, you know how a decision tree works, where it says, does it move, question mark, yes or no? And then you say no. And then you go, should it move? Yes yeah. or no? Yeah. Yeah. And then the answer is WD-40. And then if you do the opposite, it's does it move? And you say yes. And you say, should it move? And the answer is no. And the answer is duct tape. Duct tape. Right, right, right. Well, and the thing is, too, is if you have sealed bearing seats, you yeah. may not want to put WD-40 in anything that has a sealed bearing. So then you have to, you know, see what where maybe what you need to do and is there a better a better alternative? Right. So maintenance is a good way to check things over. We always check things before we go through a regatta, checking the oars length and end boards. But also the important thing is the club needs to have to hand simple things so that people washing the boats can do a quick repair. So you need to have a toolbox and a supply of I call them consumables. So nuts, washers, spare gates, spare shoes, spare steering wire, uh, hatch covers, you know, maybe spare seats under carriages. We have a particular uh, double action seat that has a, a white thing that clamps and holds the wheel axles the correct mm -hmm. distance apart. And you know, if that the clips come off sometimes and they just work loose, they're just molded plastic. So what are the sorts of things, Marlene, that you'd recommend people have in their repair sort of spare parts? Um, I would have a pair of extra oar locks for sure. Um, I would have those little push on washers that, that people use to adjust Pink the height. Box. Yeah, Pink yes, box. Ex exactly. <laughs> Pusher outer washers. Right. And, you know, those, those for sure. If you have, um, you know, boats with different sizes, like what, what is the size of the top bolts? on yeah. the various boats that you have, because some might be a metric, yeah. some might not be metric, and you need to know what is what. Wing nuts yeah. for foot stretchers. Um, those little those little things that you put in the in the foot stretcher guide that then you put the foot stretcher on top of and turn those the wing bolts. nut up. Yeah. Yep. yeah. So those you definitely, you definitely need to have some of those. Uh, seat wheels, extra seat wheels. Like even when I change wheels on my seats i always save the old ones just in case um oh, huh. you know think well just things to have as spare parts in case something yeah. like that happens but old warlocks um slide, shoelaces slide, slide end stoppers end stoppers and also those little tiny wing nuts that go on on the slides from on the underside of the slide they're a different because, diameter aren't they yeah, yeah. Th those are small um bow ball you know what if you lose yeah. a bow ball you want to make sure you have at least one extra bow ball or a ten, oh, some tennis always balls always buy two yeah. if you're buying replacements always buy two cuz you'll need them <laughs> exactly exactly so that's uh, a you know a short list of things and then it's important your members know how to use them how to replace them you know do you just tape your bow balls on do you glue them so moving on then to minor repairs the most common thing that happens to rowing boats that isn't, you know, a spare part wearing out is a small nick in under the water level to the hull. And it's usually you've approached the dock and you've hit the corner of the dock, even though it might have a, you know, some cushioning on it, you know, and sometimes you've bent a rigger, which is not great. But more importantly, you take the little bit of the gel coat, the paint off the outside of the hull. Now, this is an easy repair with tape. Dry the boat off. Always use electrical tape. I don't like duct tape because it's textured, so it's not smooth, but you can use it in emergencies. And use scissors to cut the tape and then really press it down really hard. It makes a really good bond. It'll stick there and it'll cover that little hole and prevent water ingress. Yes, a good, tri a good trick for that is... Um... Even if if you if you have a way just to, to rub with a cloth really quickly over over the place where you're going to put the white tape, and then cut the white tape, and when it's a little bit warm, stick the white tape on so it gets a really good really good oh. bond. Mm. So little dings in the hull, they are going to happen. Bigger dings that go through to the honeycomb. So most modern boats have a honeycomb layer and carbon and Kevlar on the side. Um, once it's gone through to the honeycomb, that's more dangerous because then water can then spread further around, you know, where the repair is. And that means you do need to do a waterproof repair. It's going to be pretty easy to do yourself. 
you can get some epoxy you can get there are various repair kits that you can buy for all sorts of um i wouldn't recommend fiberglass but you know yeah that you, used to be done on oars you could wrap fiberglass around an oar um sometimes you can get um you can purchase actually like like what they call little micro balloons like it's 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 like a, it almost looks like a very very fine powder you would get it from your boat builder and mm -hmm. and if it's something like something like a puncture almost like you know like something went into it like a screwdriver or some sharp object mm -hmm. um you can then mix the epoxy with a little bit of micro balloons and yeah. you know it just makes it a little bit thicker so that you can pack pack that in because the the epoxy can drip down into the honeycomb but you want that yeah. to be a little bit more solid so that's something that yeah. can work sometimes too you're unlikely to be affecting the structural integrity of the hull what you're generally doing is just adding weight to the boat with these little things and if your boat builder will sell you a small pot of paint it's really worth um, touching it up if you can it it looks nicer um but, you know, it's not the end of the world, although a boat builder said to me recently that when they have colored boats, normal white, matching the white is difficult, but he has white mm -hmm. paint from popular boat builders. But when you have colored boats, he actually said the best way to make the boat look nice again after you've done these repairs is to use a wrap, a PVC wrap, like they heat wrap onto cars to, you know, put logos and things on them. Um, and he said it's pretty, it costs about, probably 450 us to do an entire eight and then it's like having a new paint job wow and he said if you have a problem with it you can always use a heat gun take it off and do it again in a year or two's time interesting so little repairs it's worth getting the skill in the club to find people who are confident doing a repair um most boat building isn't very complex uh, you can do it yourself um but fundamentally, if you, it keeps costs down. When the equipment looks nice, people look after it better, is my general rule of thumb. However, there are times when you do have to go to a professional repairer. So it's worth knowing people locally who have experience working with carbon. That's what you're looking for. They don't need to be rowing boat experts, but they do need to understand the materials that you're going to be expecting them to work with. Now, I had an <clears throat> unfortunate incident in my private boat recently where we ran up a, a pontoon. It had been put out for a regatta. I'd completely forgotten it was there and um, I wasn't looking. And we, we basically dented. It was just a very small indentation in the hull of probably the first you know, five or six feet of the bow. And it was just a flat patch, but it, but it had crushed the honeycomb. So the repair was they actually cut out a very long strip, wasn't very wide, um, about the width of, a bit wider than my palm, and made a replacement, replacing the honeycomb, replacing the carbon, and then repainting it. <laughs> Interestingly, he gave me the strip he'd cut out, which I've given to my club as a uh, trophy, which we can give to somebody for an unfortunate <laughs> incident at our comedy club awards night. But... That sort of repair and any very large crushes, indentations, hull puncturing, generally boats, if they're really bad, have to go back into a mold so that you get the shape right. And that is a professional job. And it takes time, but it's worth, worth it because at the same time, you can then have other minor repairs done to the hull. You may want to have it resprayed at the same time so that it comes back looking good. Um, we did this with a boat that we purchased. It wasn't in very good nick. Um, and so we removed all the internal fitments and fittings. So it was just down to its hull and the deck. Um, and then we had that sanded back, resprayed, polished. And then we, we took the labor, we did the labor ourselves to refit all of the foot stretchers and the riggers and the nuts and the bolts and so on. Wow. Well, and, and, you know, boat repair can be quite fascinating. And, and I, I actually had a very interesting experience. Um, this was quite a long time ago, back in about 1984, 1985. And um, the Riverside Boat Club trailer um, went off the road and crashed, uh. leaving, it was leaving St. Catharines, Ontario, 
heading back to the border to cross back in, at Buffalo into New York State. And when they they changed lanes, one of the wheels dropped off the edge of the highway and it, the whole trailer rolled. And there was a beautiful Stempley, wooden Stempley quad on that trailer that was that was damaged quite severely. And when it got back to Boston, they they took the quad into the, the MIT boathouse shop and they brought over two of the boat builders from Stempley from Switzerland. <gasps> and and I worked with them for that um, week and a half, two weeks to rebuild that quad. So we rebuilt the wooden structure of the quad. And then they brought they brought over the veneers, the the that yes. was blonde mahogany, or I think it was blonde mahogany, but it was a blonde wood veneer and they cut it all into sections and what they actually do is they actually varnish one side of the veneer and when they're getting ready when they're getting ready to actually take the veneer and place it onto onto the structure of the hull they wet it with a sponge from one hand and heat it from underneath from another hand and they dilate the wood and that and they actually like it actually pops into the shape of the boat and then they put it on in quarters and, na and nail it down and this, this was absolutely fascinating to watch. It was wonderful. But so I was able to, to work with the two builders from Stempley to, to rebuild this quad, which then went back to Riverside, Riverside Boat Club. So it was really quite, quite an interesting experience. Wow, that is just brilliant. And of course, that sort of skill, I bet, is dying out. Yes, yeah, to work with wood like that and uh, was pretty, pretty amazing. Wow. So the last thing that we want to talk about is paying for repairs. Now, this is a, t a touchy subject because mo clubs will carry boat insurance for sure. And that's, you know, a all good and appropriate. But sometimes if you've had a, a run of issues and claims, your excess is very high. The amount you have to pay yourself before the insurance company will cover the balance. And if you have a lot of claims, they understandably when your policy comes up for renewal they put up the price of the policy they may also increase the excess now some clubs i know try to get levies off their members to pay for minor repairs that they do not want to make an insurance claim on and again this is something that is very much up to the individual but it may be worth considering because accidents do happen Sometimes the accident is very clearly the fault of the people in the boat. Sometimes it's not. You know, we had a collision recently between a canoe and a rowing boat. And it was not the rowing boat occupant's fault. But there wasn't very much that we could do about it. The damage actually was to the canoe, mm -hmm. not to the rowing boat. But again, is that appropriate? Does it fit the policies that your club has? And, you know, we might be talking $500 here. We might be talking $2,000, you know. And for some people, that's a lot. Most of us, it's a lot of money. But, you know, for some people, that's a very, very big challenge. So what is appropriate in terms of paying for repairs? Well, I, I think, as you said, I mean, this, this comes into overall club policy and what are the expectations of the membership. So perhaps... Perhaps one portion or a certain amount from each membership dues can go into a fund that that covers some basic boat repair. Um, that's certain. I think I think it's important having having a designated fund to cover parts and materials and possibly professional help. Um, so that is something that the club could think about and you know how they do it is going to depend a little bit on what the atmosphere of the club is I think I think that's definitely true and it a little fund like that is really worthwhile so for example a club I used to belong to had a um, standard due that they used for anyone who was going to race and it was something like 20 it was in the UK so it was 20 pence per person per race they were doing so if you're going to a regatta and you're doing three races you paid 60p and that was set aside for covering repairs on the trailer so it was new tires or um so in this country you have to have a warrant of fitness for your trailer you know which is an annual cost and it has to be it gets licensed 
separate from the towing vehicle, so slightly different mm -hmm. system. But, you know, there are costs associated with, with trailers. You know, it's like, well, that was good. You know, that seemed like a worthwhile thing to do. Um, so, I, you know, again, I think some of those things are, you know, appropriate. Yes, or, or like you said, if there's a, a dedu in, insurance deductible for X amount of money, perhaps yeah. the, the boat repair fund should at least be funded to that level that it would cover a major, yeah. a major deductible for a repair. Yeah, I think that's, those sorts of things are, are worthwhile looking at. But again, in the same way that you manage your household finances, you need to plan these things and budget them and know roughly, you know, is it every five years that you're likely to need new tires, you know, and, and how much are they likely to be and, and what's the cost? So you don't really want to be making a profit per se, but you do want to be um, putting some money aside for those mm -hmm. days when you do need them. Yes, and, and that's actually uh, on that topic, you know, if a club tends to buy and sell equipment, you know, looking at the lifespan of mm -hmm. a boat, you know, if they buy a new boat, what is the best age to sell that boat to get a good return on that boat? so that you can invest the money in, into new equipment. And um, I know equipment that I've managed in more, say, professional situations, um, we've, we've resold the boat after two to three years yeah. because we could sell it for a good enough price, you know, if, especially if the boat is in good shape, enough that it helps to reinvest into a new boat of similar quality. That's a very interesting strategy. And it's like people buying new cars. There are some people who always sell their car when the warranty comes up. Um, one of yeah. our visitors is saying, in Portugal, we use the boat to the limit. Yeah, my club uses boats to the limit. We are we literally, at this weekend, put two doubles out. And we have a plan to rent a skip. So here's a separate question, which I do think is worthwhile. What on earth can you do with old boats so that they don't go into landfill? I, I, I don't know the answer. I mean, yes, sometimes you can sell them to bars <laughs> or whatever who want to chop them up and hang them in the roof or, you know, make trophy cabinets out of old wooden boats, which are just beautiful if you've got them. But we these aren't old wooden boats. These are old carbon fiber boats. They're not beautiful. Um, so that's a kind of a challenge. I don't, yes, I don't know. How, yes. How do you how do you recycle that type of material? Um, any, anyone know the answer? Get in touch and let us know. Yes. So I think we satisfactorily covered the outlines of rowing boat damage, maintenance and repair, but definitely come back to us and let us know what you think and whether or not there's a question that we didn't cover that we should have covered. Yes, and, so and being yes, and being racing season, it's important to keep up on these things. <laughs> Network. Please tell your rowing friends about the show. And if you've learned just one helpful thing from today's episode, please consider supporting the show for as little as one dollar per month by visiting fastermastersrowing.com forward slash podcast.